I'm not going to teach you how to use Python because that we could go for hours and there's guys like Savoir Faire Linux and Centrenade that can do this. But I would like to make sure that you understand how this Python is being used in the ecosystem. So Eric actually showed you rigging, but what I would like to show you is where Python is used in every step in a production from concept to finishing. And then what sort of knowledge you need to have from beginner, intermediate, or advanced. So let me introduce myself. Uh, okay. So I've been doing this for 20 years. Yes, I'm old. That's okay. Totally fine with this. So I worked 10 years at Softimage. Yes, I know. They kill Softimage, but that's okay. Um, were four years at Autodesk, so I work on the Maya product. The, the, the mental reintegration in XSI and in Maya. And I spent four amazing years at Industrial Light and Magic. Okay? So I've been doing a lot of rendering next generation and working on really, really cool, cool projects. Um, joined a digital district to build a really brand new pipeline from zero. So the, the thing that is really, really cool is that when you join a company, they have a lot of legacy like they have something already established. And the challenge that I had by joining these guys is I had to build everything from scratch. I had no legacy. So this is the cool stuff. However, this is the sad stuff because I have no legacy. So I, every time I say, hey, can we do this? No, we got to code it. Okay. So we're in a point right now where we have this uh, multi-site uh, shotgun based pipeline. And it's going really well. And we're building tools on top of that, and that's, it's really, really great. So just to talk to you about my background, where I came to do this kind of things, um, everything started with Legos. Yes, building blocks of life. Who is a Lego lover here? Yeah, I love you guys. The rest, <laughs> buy a box of Lego, come on. So, um, I started like a long time ago, uh, basic, visual, basic, Pascal, Perl, my gosh, Perl, Java and JavaScript, C and C++, I wanted to get serious, and then discovered Python. My life changed. My health got better. That's amazing. So this is where I came from, and I, something that I, I want to you guys understand that most of these languages are not something that you will learn in school. It's something that you te teach yourself or you take course, like savoir faire. Um, you got to learn by yourself. So Python, it's, it's not like read this book and you know it all. It's even after 20 years, I'm still learning about Python every day. Okay? So that's, that's something really important. My goal today is to be able to present you the vast ecosystem of Python in the VFX and animation business, okay? Uh, it's quite amazing how it's actually being used. So what sort of Python skills and the Python level you need for the different departments you'll be working on a feature film on a, you know, VFX project? And also eventually try to get you interested to open a shell and start to type some, some Python code. Why Python? So Eric has actually covered uh, this a little bit, but Python is pretty much integrated in, in all software that we use nowadays, okay? From new to Softimage to Maya, so on and so forth. Um, it's widely adopted by its CG community. So ILM was one of, one of the first to actually use Python and, and, um, and CG and VFX. So, and that basically, they have a like, huge legacy of code over there. Um, there's a lot of, because when you start with Python, you can code, you know, you don't have to start encoding everything from zero. There's a lot of modules that will help you to get started. So it's not like you got to say, okay, how do I open a file? No, no, there's function for, you know, operation and built-ins to be able to do these kind of things. The one that is really, really important is cross-platform and really portable. So if you code on a particular platform, we, in our case, we're using uh, Mac and Linux. Thank God we're not using Windows. I don't want to offend anybody here. Uh, I get skin rash from Windows, using Windows. 
Um, the thing that is pretty cool is that we have this pipeline using Mac and Linux. We do all the development uh, basically on Linux and we go straight to Mac and it works. And that is the cool thing, okay? I have to recompile, it just runs. Given that you have the, the plugins and the modules compiled for the platform as well. And it's runtime execution in the sense that it's not like you got to go and compile and to take the SO file and bring it to the right place and then suddenly the platform change and it's just basically the file change, then it will basically sort of internally recompile it. Something that is important is I divided Python knowledge and skills in three levels, basic, intermediate, and advanced. Um, and then there's Guru, and then Jedi Master, and then there's Yoda, and obviously I'm not Yoda. I'm better than him. <laughs> so um, something that is important is that even in every job that you do, uh, whether you're a concept artist, you know, map painter, compositor, you can actually, you could use some Python skills. Whether it's a basic skill, it can help you to automate some of the tasks. So, and that's what I would like to convey here. Okay, so just to give you an example of what I consider basic Python knowledge is, you know, anything that has related to files and directory, processing and management. So, for instance, you want to copy a file. Yeah, you can drag and drop it, but let's say you have to find specific files and then find those files that are nested somewhere and then basically copy it into one directory. So this is the type of code that you would get in, the, um, in Python. And when you think about this, typing this in Python or typing this in a shell, you know, it's a, a, a bad shell, Windows or a shell in, uh, in Linux, you see it's not that much more lines of code. It's just like copy this, source, destination. And then you can do this uh, both on um, on Linux or on, on the Mac, okay? Renaming a file. Obviously, you can double click on the file and just rename it. But let's say you have massive amount of renaming with some logic, you know, you can use Python to do these type of rename, okay? Resequencing files. Gosh, there's so, I know there's some software out there to be able to rename. Let's say I got everything started at frame 1001, I would like to rename at zero, or one, or I would like to add some padding and things like that. This is the type of thing that is typical, that you know, when you're stuck, you just write a little script and then you get going. Especially useful when you, you know, you're doing like compositing or stuff like that. So a simple loop with the, the actual command will get you by, you know. So this is what I call basic Python, is give me a, give me a do a certain task or repeat that task over, over and over again with files and directories, okay? So this is one example of what I call basic. Everybody could actually take an advantage of having an advantage of learning some of those basic functionality. Okay, so this is sort of bison, uh, basic Python. And intermediate Python is, now you're getting a notch up. You know, you really like, starting to get deeper into Python. So you could have command line utilities. And I have some fun one in there. So you probably should re be reading <laughs> some of the command line in there. So scanning a directory and applying an operation on specific file types. So in this case is, I, I written a Python script that will scan and fix me, okay? And uh, basically apply an operation, it's called delete my face. That could be <laughs> just one thing. You know, erase me from the surface of the earth, you know. Um, you know, Python has image processing, image, uh, image uh, library for processing like image and, and uh, photos. Converting an image file from one format to, to the other. So you could say, okay, take uh, basically all the JPEGs from this directory, convert it from JPEG to EXR, you know. And then it will search it where, wherever they are. Scanning for image data, and this is actually kind of cool because Python can actually allow you to do this, is to look at the metadata of your images. You know when you take a picture with your iPhone and Android, you don't want your mother to know where you were? Python is used for that, okay? 
So you can actually go and open a JPEG file, open the metadata, and possibly fake a geotag. Say I was in Africa, boom, voila. And do many crazy things like that. So metadata could be retrieving the date, the comments, the author, you know, and messing around with the, the information so Facebook doesn't know. So this is a, <laughs> you're basically chasing, <laughs> This is actually a joke. You basically have a Python script called Chez Serge, and you're basically faking a new uh, different coordinate because you don't want to know that you were at Chez Serge. That's just a joke. Um, you could say, you know, delete all geotags or replace it with a new coordinate. You know, that could be one thing. Resize images of a specific uh, resolution. Like, find me everything that is basically not square, you know, power of two. You remember power two? Yeah, 512 by 512, 1024 by 1024. If you have something 2K by 1K, you want to find those and then resize it. Because there's certain software that needs the, to use that. So Python actually can use that. So this is what I call intermediate Python. A little bit more advanced processing. I'm not going to show you how to do it. I'm basically merely just showing you that Python can actually do these kind of things. And especially 3 in the morning when you're stuck, it can help you. Another example, build custom Python modules. So py Python module, when you think about this, is, is, is a place, it's a box, where you put code to be able to reuse it. Okay? So this way you don't have to write code over and over again for the same thing you want to do. Okay? So you're starting to organize your code in this box. It's a toolbox really what it is. And then you can do pretty fancy stuff in there. So this is what I call, you know, when you're starting to get organized, you're starting to be serious. Some basic user interface. And here I'm not talking about like graphical user interface, you know, with manipulation and 3D viewport. I'm talking about basic dialogues. So let's say you have a command line tool, you just want to slap a very, very basic you know, combo box with a file browser and OK cancel and something that validates the input before signing the command. This is what I call intermediate level. And you can do this with Python very easily. So these are different modules that could actually be used for these, these type of things. So you got arc parse, which is a module that will allow you to take command line arguments and, and treat it. And it will validate whether the data is correct or not. It will, you can say, hey, this argument is required. This one is optional. And it will bill you the online help if, you, if your user is, is not following what you, uh, what you have coded. PIL, which is the Python image library for uh, basic image manipulation, JPEGs, and things like that, does not support 32-bit yet, or limited fashion, maybe for TIFF. But it has. Pretty basic, you know, functionality for image processing. And you have OpenImage.io, which is uh, a really advanced image processing. So you can load images with multi-channels, 32-bit, uh, and basically I use this to create slates, you know, like shot number and, and you know, user and then version and things like that. It's basically a compositing uh, engine straight into Python, okay? Um, Last one is PySign and PyQt, which are modules uh, based, are basically a, a layer on top of Qt to create those user interface. So this is what I call intermediate uh, Python. Advanced, there's multiple levels. Remember, like advanced, Jana Master, Yoda, me? <coughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, there's different levels. So you can start to create your own custom classes. Custom classes is, see this as, you're making a robot and you want to tell some commands to this robot, like move, talk, you know, pick up this box. And you're starting to put some intelligence to your code. This is a way to organize. It's beyond modules. It's, it's basically to be able to wrap this in an object-oriented fashion. Advanced user interface, starting to make connections, selection, you know, being able to zoom in and zoom out and being able to display things in a very complex fashion, <coughs> gesture. Drag and drop, for instance, being able to drag and drop between different uh, you know, applications. So we have custom drag and drop rules in Maya. So whenever you, draw, you drag and drop from a web browser, 
we receive a message and then we treat it and say, hey, this is a movie file. What do you want to do with this? And we pop up a menu and we ask the user what to pick and what to use. You know. So this is a little bit more advanced. Gesture, because Qt can actually be used for gestures. Again, Python modules over there to if you want to learn about this, PySide and PyQt. Um, there's Web, XML, and HTML5, which are not coding languages. They are description languages. They are basically there to describe something which is used to, to transport information. So if you say I'm coding HTML, it's Java that does the coding. Okay. So again, you have modules for this. You are a parse, you are a lib, lib 2, 3, XML, mini DOM. And these are all modules that are provided. So if you want to take a huge XML file that somebody gave you and you want to look for something, you can open a text editor and then search for it. But you can actually give it to the module and say, hey, parse this and find me this information. And then this is another way that it can actually be done. Advanced Python 2. Now we're talking Jedi Master. Multi-threading. So, for instance, uh, one of the usage I have for this is Python uh, multi-threading can be a little bit finicky. In a sense, it's not true threading, which basically when you want to run, you want to use all the cores to be able to run Python and do some processing. If you know how to use it, it can actually be, be pretty useful. For instance, when we publish a huge image sequence you know, for layout, you know, we could have like 800 files or so. Um, when you think about this, the, the computer, if you have 12 core, 24 cores, then in fact we're copying 12 images at the same time. So it can actually cut down the actual copying or, and, or file I.O. processes like massively. Python has modules for this. So we're talking multi-threading, threads, and queues. Queues are basically a list of things that you need to execute and then we'll execute in the queue. You have also process control and communication. So let's say your Python script wants to start Maya command line and then feed some arguments and then Maya will do some processing and then write up out the file and then you take this file and you read it back to say, hey, it worked, you know? So you're starting to automate some of the process. Now you're starting to get into pipeline stuff. So there's modules like process, subprocess, XML, RPC, Redis. So process communication is like, let's say you want to have Maya and Mary talking to each other. How you get these two processes to, to talk to each other is like, hey, I know somebody's on the other side. I don't know who it is, but I need to talk to. So basically Python would allow you to create a tunnel, a pipe and say, hey, are you there? Yeah. And you have all these communication handled by Python. So this, this is a little bit more advanced, but it is possible. Database. Relational database, keyframe, non-relational database, uh, basically has all the Python modules to be able to organize your data and search through it very rapidly. And then um, you know, organize it or you know, process it, do whatever you want. Persistence. So let's say you want to save a config file. I actually missing one module of the config parser. Let's say you want to have a file that is describing, let's say, a Kraken you know, file, right? Which uh, module you use for uh, description? Probably JSON. JSON? Yeah. So there's some JSON, YAML um, that are used. You can use Pickle, so Python has its own way to serialize, to take something and then combine it into a small description and then decompress it so it will restore itself. So all these modules are available to you, okay? And this, and then some of those, you know, for example, pickle and cpickle, uh, you can basically serialize in a binary form or ASCII form. One is not human readable. ASCII is not human readable, but at least <laughs> you see some, something. Uh, JSON and, and YAML, you can give this to a human and the person can go in and say, hey, I need to change this option from, from yes to no. You can do these kind of things. Okay? Okay, Yoda. Woo. -hoo -hoo. So image processing and compositing. So Open Image IO is the perfect, perfect, perfect uh, software for this. It has built-in um, 
basic multi-threading with Python. Um, you can load an open EXR, load pretty much any channels, copy paste, crop, uh, you know, you know, blur, uh, analyze, and we use it. In our case, we we're using it for detecting bad frames. You know, pixel that are infinite numbers, NANDs. Remember, like not a number, which you know, when you have a file like this and then you load it in into a software like Mary, for instance, Mary doesn't like it. So you want to be able to test this. So OpenImageIO allows you to do this. OpenEXR as well, to be able to open an uh, OpenEXR, uh, add some metadata, for instance, the shot that it was rendered in, um, you know, what render it was, what version, what is the person who created that file. You know, the file can actually belong to the farm, so you want to put some data in there. So Python allows you to, to do these kind of things. And ImageMagic, which is a kind of a simpler image manipulation tool, um, has a bunch of command line tools to generate, you know, icons and things like that. We use this to generate titling. So all the labels and into the, the stuff. Anything that has to do with color science, you know, so for example, you got Rec 709. Oh, what is that? sRGB. Oh, what is that? Huh? Yes. Linear. And then um, log and log lin, lin log. So when you want to convert color spaces, then there's Python modules to do this. You know, going from uh, HSV, HLS to RGB and uh, YMCK. YMCA? <laughs> so being able to take images and actually being able to track a point as the camera moves. There is some technology out there. So you can use Python for these things. You don't need to have a software to do this. You can have basically compile the library have the Python module, and you could say, hey, this, uh, this is an image sequence. Could you figure out the actual camera position? It's a little bit tougher, but you know, these are type of stuff that you can do. Math and simulation. So if you basically dealing with a lot of data, and then you need to have like computation where precision is really, really important, you know, double precision, so on and so forth. These are modules that exist. There's a vast world out there for Python. If you think, if you say, is there a Python module for something, if you search, you will most likely find a Python module. It might be old, but at least, will, at least it will get you started. Ah, okay, so the other part is geometrical. So being able to carry geometries and models. So Lambic is actually, has, is available as a plugin in Maya, but there's also a Python module for this. You can compile Python as a standalone viewer and actually load the Lambic straight in Python. It will load as a, uh, as a viewer. So you can look at the model, look at the data, right? Open VDB. So if you have uh, volumes like fires and, and, and particles and dust, you know, there's open source project like Open VDB that allows you to actually express these things and be able to store information. So you can convert a model straight into an actual volume data. And then this can be used for, let's say, optimizing some part of the, your, your pipeline. So um, particles, there's Partio, which is a, uh, Disney has created this, uh, this open source project for particles. So you can have basically a particle simulator straight into Python, which is pretty cool. So you can go in there and actually say, oh, I'm going to create fire, whoa. But if you have data and you need to process this, these are type of modules you can, you can use. Okay, so these are the two slides that I want you to remember. The rest you can forget. Doesn't matter, okay? Basically, I'm going to go through every domain or disciplines inside VFX and animation and kind of position what you need to know in Python to be able to, to use those skills. You know, are you, do you need to be just beginner, intermediate, or advanced? And I'll go very quickly. Coordination. Coordinator can actually use some, some Python. Sometimes, you know, copying files and things like that. I doubt that people are interested, but they could. Concept and storyboard. You know, they deal with a lot of files, PSD files to be able to separate and stitch files and things like that. Previous, previous to the 2D, it's mostly like animated, you know, sprites, things like that. So if they get something from you know, another department, things like that, they need to rearrange it and reorganize it, you know, Python can be used for that. 
3D previs or onset previs. This one is a little bit more advanced because now you're talking about real-time data and mocap data. You're talking about you know ingesting this information. So you need to be you know intermediate and advanced. You know it would be better. Otherwise, you would kind of look uh, like a full onset. You know because you need to be able to slap script together and things like that. Modeling, you know, it's you know, beginner, but modelers who can actually automate some of this stuff can actually use some of, some of this, you know, being able to actually uh, repeat some, some of the actions. Camera tracking, same thing, you know, dealing with camera, converting cameras to different file formats, or, you know, analyzing some curves and smoothing some curves. Roto is, as well falls in, inside the same thing. Editorial, um, editorial, actually, a lot of people act, you know, think about this, they, they just like cut and things like that, but when they get something that's kind of broken, they could use Python to fix it, you know. So these are different ways to do it. Layout, people tend to think that layout is actually kind of, oh, you're just moving cameras and positioning, you know, props and things like that. But actually, I've seen some really, really advanced people in layout that can actually almost code kind of a, a layout pipeline in Maya. And those are the, the amazing people that I always love to work with because they know they, know they can automate. So if you say, hey, you know, can I do this? No, okay, I'll slap a you know, script together and I'll do it. Stereo. So stereo is sort of a commonplace, whether if this translates into the, the cells of the movie. This is another uh, story. But stereo is the same thing. So stereo can actually... When you think about this, a stereo is not just about two cameras, but it's about taking two plates and then registering it and then processing it and then analyzing it and things like that. So there's a lot of different steps. So having Python, especially for camera rigs, for instance, you know, having, um, so for something advanced, yeah, he's a professional rigger, so he says, nah, it's easy. Surfacing and look, look dev. So anything that has to do with shaders, shading network, textures, um, they could use a lot of Python code to do these kind of things, converting textures. Uh, the thing that most people don't know is Python, because it's an interpreted language, basically it does not compile, it sort of pre-compiles in memory. Um, it's not fast enough to be used in a renderer. So Python is not used as a shading language because it's just not fast enough. So when you're dealing with millions and millions of ray hits, uh, it's just not fast enough. Okay, so Python, if somebody says, I wrote a shader in Python, you could say, <laughs> get lost, man. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. And rigging, definitely intermediate, but advanced, it's much better. Okay. Now the other slide, let's continue. Animation. So. Animators that can actually automate and write themselves some scripts to be able to select things and things like that, being able to offset, do some basic uh, step and repeat, you know, being able to automate some of the stuff is actually, you know, a good thing. Um, hair clot sim, definitely you really need to have to be intermediate and up to uh, advance to do these kind of things because hair sims is sometimes like the sim didn't work, you just want to resim one file, or one frame, or you want to do a fix. This you're constantly kind of patching up because sim is, you know, it's not predictable because it's a simulation. Um, particle simulation is the same thing. Particle is, is probably more heavy in terms of Python coding because you can actually write code to change the behavior of the particle as it it, it grows. And you say, okay, I'm going to live for one second and then split myself in two. To, and then so on and so forth. Crowd sim is definitely more complex because it involves rigging, it involves rendering, it involves pipeline, it involves copying files, it involves checking if all the files are there. It's all of the holy grail. So if you say, you know, there's cr some crowd tools out there, you know, Golab, for instance, that is sort of a turnkey thing. But if you want to deal with those massive, massive shots, uh, that you see battle shots, you know, there's more uh, better uh, tools for this. I haven't seen some Golem. Have you guys used uh, Golem or looked into it? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a turnkey system uh, ready to use, but if you want to go with really, really complex shot, you know, 
definitely you will need to have uh, advanced knowledge over there. Fluid sim falls in, I would say, a little bit more than particle because there's fluid sims, depending on the type of system. You can use a turnkey system, but at ILM, there was a, like a three-phase thing, which is, you know, getting a rough surface, and then after, after that, getting some, like, the mist, and then after that, the, the foam. So it was kind of is a stage pipeline where you, you pump the result of one to the other, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of automation that needs to happen for this. So you need to have this sort of knowledge. Destruction is another one where you got to basically take a model and totally destroy it and actually go in there and then make sure that all the UVs are fine and all the textures and the material assignments are there, things, uh, things like that. So it, it does require a lot of knowledge for this. Lighting, um, definitely lighting, uh, you know, I would, I would say probably not as much in terms of advanced, but definitely an intermediate. Matte painting is, is uh, more like texture projections and being able to take something and then process it with PTEX or, you know, doing large camera projections, processing images and then stitching it be, uh, together. So, for instance, you know, I use um, Argile Soft. Uh, I don't know what is the, the software. And then the, there was like uh, 40, um, you know, 4K textures just to, to take a desert dune, like dune or something like that. And the system couldn't handle so much data, so I basically ported everything to Mary and used uh, multiple camera projections with blends. And, and basically, I just exported the data that shows all the cameras in position and then re-imported this in Mary. And I was able to actually get a pretty high fidelity a camera projection and reconstruction. Rendering and render farms falls in, in the realm of you need to be a little bit of a, like an IT guy, sysadmin, slash know all the discipline because you sort of need to mash all this together. So the more, it's really, people say, no, 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 I'm a render wrangler, it's easy. No, it's actually um, a lot of work to do a really good job. Compositing, definitely, you know, compositing needs to be intermediate because you need to automate, let's say you want to take a comp, process it, update some, some of the references and things like that. So you need to navigate the tree, understand how to do this navigation concept and, and relationship. Finishing and grading, that would be more, um, you know, automating certain basic like script flow. So let's say stuff got in, you want to dump it on the flame or you want to process it, you want to validate some of the data that comes in. This is the type of thing that actually can be used for that. And then pipeline is sort of, you really be, <laughs> need to be advanced because you need to support all these guys and, and all the discipline and then make sure that stuff is working. So the more you know about it, the better. And still to this day, I still learn every day from my own colleagues and my own employees um, because they know they have discovered something I haven't discovered. And then we even do on, on, uh, on Wednesdays uh, lunch where we'll get together and we talk Python and we share. And I learned stuff from people who have been coding Python for two years. They've learned something and said, oh, I didn't know about that. So I'm still learning. So that's the cool thing. Where to start? So python.org, if you want to download it and get the stuff you know, um, on your computer. Um, if you're looking for some answers, you want to know how people solve some of the problems, Stack Flow, Stack Overflow is actually a good place to go for Python examples. Python has its own of like, uh, latest, how to learn py py Python, how to get started with Python. Um, there's also some wiki about beginner guides, so we can learn Python. Uh, some utilities. One app that I find really, really cool is I can go Python on the iPad. Awesome. So who the hell wants to do this? Me. Okay. <laughs> um, I actually use it sometimes. Um, I was traveling a lot back in, in, in my other job, so sometimes I had to do some, some testing about certain like class der derivation and then you know some of the advanced Python stuff and meta class and things like that. So it allowed me to prototype and try things in Python. So I would not basically code everything with this app, but allow me to actually just get stuff uh, running. You can actually uh, develop games with that. So it has basically a scene view, a graphic view, sound. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, some editors, 
Uh, PyCharm, which is free, open source. There's the uh, community version. It's uh, actually really, really good. Sublime Text is actually really good. There's others like Eclipse. Eclipse is actually a little bit more intermediate or advanced. I would say just, just wait. You know, don't go straight to Eclipse because otherwise you get scared. Um, Python version. Python 2.6 and 2.7 are mostly used in most software, okay? And this is for the VFX and animation community. Python 3.0 has not been widely adopted. So if you want to start to learn Python, start with 2.6, okay? And then when you start to see Python 3.0 being adopted by Autodesk and other vendors, start to learn it. And right now, we're not even looking right now at Python 3.0. However, read about it so you know when you code something, it will be 3.0 aware. Learn 2.7, then start to look at 3.0. Another thing also is there's plenty of books out there. O'Reilly's books are really, really good. I'm actually a big fan. They call me by my first name now because I have them all. Um, you can actually buy the, a lot of these books. You can go to Nat Center because Nat Center will be working with Savoir Faire Linux. Um, these are my closing recommendation about Python. So if you want to start working in Python, there's a few things that I hope somebody told me when I start to learn and use Python. Don't skip Python. You know, the, these are thick book. They're our first page, and there's a reason why they're our first page. It's because you need to read it, because it shows really, really important information. So when I do an interview for TD, you would be amazed how basic principles are not understood. What is the difference between a set, a list, and a tuple? You know, most people, I would say 70%, don't even, are not able to answer this, which is, wow. So read every page. They are there for that. They are going to explain. Spend that time because you will be able to actually leverage this. Practice, 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 okay? And the only way to achieve this is by actually throwing yourself like challenges. Here's a good example of pet project I do at home when I'm not working. Um, I'm really bad with images and organizing all my images from different phones. So I put it in a directory to classify one, to classify two, to cl and it becomes a... It's like I got duplicated images like all over the place. The names are different. I basically use Python to actually go in there, open the image, compute the checksum of the image, find the duplicate, and then move all the, the images to a place to say, OK, this one I have it, this one I have it. And I just let the computer run. And it builds me a directory with all the, the images that are basically unique. You know, these are the type of things. Throw yourself you know, a problem. I wanted to um, win the lottery. It didn't work. <laughs> but actually, I, I coded something just to see if something would come out of uh, chaos. I knew it wouldn't, but I gave it a shot. So these are pet projects that you can do at home. Um, um, so another thing is coding standards. When you start coding, there's, I can, I cannot emphasize, uh, I really need you guys to understand this, that when you start coding, take good habits at the right beginning. Don't become fat like me, okay? It's kind of like food, you know? Vegetables are good. Coding standards are good, okay? Um, coding standard, there's a lot of um, paper out there. So PEP8 is a standard that basically describes how to code. If you want to actually collaborate on some of the open source projects, they tend to actually adopt PEP8 standards. And PEP8 will describe to say if you write a function, it's like this, if you write some of the stuff. Um, I use a mixture of PEP8 and, uh, you know, it's, there's few things that I don't fully adopt, but at the office we have a coding standard and we have code reviews. We have other people to look. So when I put code, I get peers. My employees look at my code and say, Dave, you fucked up over there. Because it's good to have peer reviews. So get, share your code, share it to your friends, is, and then people say, hey, you know, you, this thing, you know, you can change it. It would be faster. And your coding style will evolve. So if you're starting to code in the modules or even a, a Python file, 
try to stick to one standard within that file. Don't change between classes or function because otherwise it will become, people will take a look at your code and say, come on, you're not serious. You know, take some good habits right from the get-go. Documentation and comments. Oh my gosh, this is so important. Um, leave and explain what you're doing in the code. I actually like to, when I describe something, to always put some kind of a nice story in there. So if somebody reads it, which I hope, they can actually have kind of a, a good laugh. So I explain, especially when it's complex, I explain the problem. I say, okay, in this section, I need to do this. I need to detect that. I need to figure out this. I need to compare with this. And then the end result, I need to have this. And I show example of what the result should look like. The more you put information in your code, the better it is. And that's really a good habit to have really, really from the beginning. So there's different uh, documentation engines out there, Doxygen, Sphinx, EPYDoc, PYDoc, which are all open source. These are ways that you can actually embed some documentation in your code, and it will extract this and generate HTML pages. If you want to impress somebody, that's a good way to do it, like me. Um, and the last one is test cases, test suites. If you write code, in fact, I spend more time test writing code that tests my code than the code itself. And you have no clue how much time that I've saved by doing this. So here's a good example. We release a new pipeline to production every two weeks. And if I go on the very, very core functionality and I change something, I rerun the test suite for this. And he says, you're good. I know it's going to work. Because in there, I basically coded with using Python stuff that will stress to say, can you publish in a shot? Can you publish under an asset? Can you publish under, you know, an asset instance under a shot that is under a sequence? And it will test all the, those permutations. Take the habit of writing code and writing tests for it. And that there are different modules for this. Doc tests, unit tests, PY tests, nodes are different modules that you can use for this. Um, and that's pretty much it.